Evergrande is one of the largest real estate developers in China. Its critical situation, with defaults of more than $120 billion, is already well known. But now, the China Securities and Exchange Regulatory Commission has accused the company of having inflated its revenues by more than $72 billion. In other words, the Chinese real estate boom could be worse than we imagined. With housing and other property prices in freefall since 2021, China's major construction companies have been inching closer and closer to bankruptcy. And the problem becomes even bigger if we take into account that the real estate sector represents more than 20% of the entire Chinese economy. It is the main economic driver of the Asian giant, even more than exports. The question is, can a definitive collapse be avoided? What is the Chinese government doing to solve the real estate crisis? The truth is that the future does not look rosy. In fact, back in 2020, Xi Jinping's people tried to prick the bubble in a controlled manner. China had become one of the countries with the highest corporate debt, largely due to developers such as Evergrande, which is the second most indebted company in the world, taking on debt up to their necks to build housing. The government was afraid that the real estate boom would get out of hand especially when its neighbor, Japan, had a similar crisis in the 1990s. It was then that under the slogan, housing is for living and not for speculation, China pushed through the so-called three red lines. In other words, three financial requirements for all real estate companies to bring them into line. First, companies had to reduce their liabilities to less than 70% of the value of their assets. Second, a company's net debt that is, its debt minus short-term assets such as cash could not exceed the company's net worth. And third, the cash available had to be sufficient to pay short-term debts. In essence, the three red lines served to limit the company's indebtedness and ensure their solvency. However, when the restrictions came into effect, virtually none of the country's major developers managed to meet the red line's requirements. The debt was already so large that it had become unmanageable. Groups such as Evergrande had net debts 81% higher than those permissible under the three red lines. But the government also ordered banks to limit lending to the sector. The result? Without the ability to continue borrowing, the companies were unable to repay previous debts, and the lack of funds caused a large number of construction projects to be stopped dead in their tracks, which limited the company's revenues. 46 major Chinese real estate companies went into a severe liquidity crisis. Millions of buyers were left without the homes they had already paid for, and if we add to this the pandemic, it was at that point that the bubble that we all know now burst. Ironically enough, it was the government's attempt to control the bubble that actually started its collapse. So what if the government hadn't seen it coming? Well, what they expected was a controlled demolition, and the problem came when COVID added enough gunpowder to blow the whole thing up. They quickly realized that such a steep drop could spread to the rest of the economy, and that's not the worst of it. Housing is by far the main savings mechanism for Chinese households. In other words, if housing values plummet, household wealth would plummet. China's real estate meltdown is battering middle-class wealth. What was once a controlled demolition of a debt-ridden sector is now a crusher of the wealth of the new middle class. Now the government wants to avoid a situation like the one Japan suffered during the 1990s, so they must deflate the housing bubble, control debt levels, and reduce prices in a controlled manner. But on the other hand, they can't do that because it would cause an unprecedented financial collapse. Is there a solution? Now, Xi Jinping's administration has finally decided decided to act. The first thing it needs is time, and that is why it has reprimed the real estate bubble to keep it from bursting. To this end, the Chinese central bank has reduced the cash ratio by almost two points. That is, banks can now lend more money. Likewise, the requirements necessary to obtain a mortgage have been considerably relaxed. For example, last May, the government reduced the down payment on mortgages from 20% of the price of the house to only 15%. And if all that has been mentioned had not been enough, a $41 billion stimulus program has been announced to buy back vacant real estate held by state-owned enterprises. But will this really do any good? Put another way, Repriming the bubble may delay the problem, yes, but not avoid it. However, there is still a second part to this plan. The road to a new economy. If there is something even more important in China than its real estate sector, it's its industry. 
In recent decades, it has grown a lot thanks to exports. This has made the Chinese economy dependent on meeting international demand, while domestic consumption represents a very small fraction. In other words, the integrity of its entire economic system now depends on maintaining its dominance over international trade. Of course, that was an easy task in the early 2000s when globalization reached its peak. However, with the current trade war with the West, everything has taken a 180 degree turn. Biden announces 100% tariff on Chinese made electric vehicles. EU threatens China EVs with tariffs of up to 38%. And what does all this have to do with the Xi Jinping's government's encouragement of the housing market? The truth is more than you can imagine. The growing protectionist tendency of the Western bloc and other countries calls into question China's entire economic model. Remember, dependence on exports. If the international market is closed to products made by foreign companies, as is the case of foreign cars, there is not much the Asian giant can do to avoid a generalized collapse of its entire export sector and therefore of its entire economy. Now, the solution to this problem seems simple. Make China less dependent on exports and more dependent on domestic consumption. In other words, companies should stop producing so many goods for the international market and start producing more goods for the local market. However, such a transformation cannot take place if household purchasing power does not increase strongly enough, something that the real estate crisis is not helping at all. After all, would you buy a new television or go on vacation if most of your savings disappeared overnight? Well, most probably not. And if your government promises you that everything will be fine and that you don't have to worry about the situation of your savings, even less so. Joking aside, China's transformation from an export-based economy to a domestic consumption-based economy is already on track. Last year alone, when tensions with the United States were mounting, China's economic growth was driven 82.5% by the country's domestic consumption, an unprecedented figure for an economy so heavily reliant on international trade. The government's idea is that, while it puts the real estate boom on hold, it can allocate sufficient time and resources to boost other sectors of the domestic economy. China unveils policy incentives to boost consumption. The Chinese government has already introduced incentives to stimulate the domestic purchase of electric cars, in addition to reducing bureaucratic and regulatory requirements on electric car transactions. You know, the same cars that will no longer be sold so easily in the rest of the world, and the same thing is happening with cell phones and laptops. Shenzhen to give out electronic subsidies for Huawei, Oppo, Vivo products to boost economy in China's sovereign tech hub. China's sovereign technology hub of Shenzhen is turning to subsidies to help boost consumption of a range of electronics and other products that include smartphones, laptops, and drones. Of course, all this will not be cheap, nor is it without issues. China currently has a problem known as overcapacity. That is, it produces far more than it needs, not only for its citizens, but for the rest of the world. Basically, due to subsidies to their industry, companies have disproportionately increased production. And naturally, if there was already overproduction with the global market, won't it be even worse if China limits itself to domestic consumption? Yes, in any case, the government intends to encourage consumption in the most rural areas of the country. These are really poor, isolated areas areas that have not received enough support from the regime so far. In other words, the idea is not just to focus on the Chinese, who already consume a lot, but that the poor Chinese will be incorporated into the overall economic engine. To this end, the state has begun to invest in digital commerce systems, infrastructure, and is supporting the sale of rural products in large cities. For now, it seems that China is succeeding in this regard, but as we have already mentioned, without solving the problem of the real estate crisis and the use of housing as an investment and savings vehicle for Chinese middle-class families, the transition to a new consumer economy seems rather unlikely. Even more so if we take into account the enormous cost of this plan, the fact that a large part of consumption will depend on public spending, and that China has a very significant overcapacity problem. But what do you think will happen? Do you think that if China continues to stimulate the real estate bubble, they will enter a period of speculation like Japan did in the 90s? Will the domestic consumption plan work? Or will it be a case of bread for today and famine tomorrow? Don't hesitate to leave us your opinion in the comments box. And if you like the video, you can show it by giving us a nice like. And if you want to support our channel, you can subscribe and follow us on our social media channels. Take care. I'll see you in the next one.